Thank you very much. Um, so AI chips built by AI, is it promise or reality? Um, we'll find out. I would say it's probably both. But um, let me start with a slide. Uh, you probably heard that slogan from Mark Andreessen. Um, I think it was in 2011, where he said, software ate the world. I'm not sure everybody understood what that meant. What he meant to say is that every company now needs to be a software company. And he was saying, well, Amazon is the largest bookseller in the world. There's actually a software company. Um, and now we've gotten to the point where AI is eating software, so now every company has to have AI. I mean, we see this all over the place. And with that, what we see is a huge demand. And also, at this point, of course, a deliberal delivery of um, high-performance compute in the AI space. You can see that um, in the uh, <coughs> a compute that's measured here in petaflops, um, that there's been an explosion, really, in the, what we would say, modern area of AI accelerators. Um, and they're all powering this, and everybody is an AI, and everybody um, wants to automate processes that were traditionally done by humans, including, you see this little animation here. This is uh, C++ coding that auto uh, completes when you start writing something. How well it works, I, I can't speak to that. So um, to power this, of course, um, uh, many companies built what we call AI super chips, and they vary from very, very small, like edge devices um, on, on your phone or, or like a drone or something that have to be super power efficient, um, primarily uh, for inferencing. <clears throat> but on the other end of the spectrum, we have huge AI accelerators that are humongous chips. Um, for example, GraphCore or servers, I'm sure you've seen them, they have like these humongous waivers um, where they have uh, these uh, operations repeated. So they're, they're instantiated many, many, many times and out of this become extremely large chips that uh, produce a huge amount of power and they're getting bigger every year. In fact, there's the AI Hardware Summit uh, starting tomorrow where many of these companies really present their <clears throat> newest, largest chips. Now, at the same time, we all know silicon scaling is waning. <clears throat> We're now, um, I, I actually remember years ago, um, I was meeting with a customer and uh, they told me, we don't know what to do anymore. You know, they, the technology is just not scaling anymore. We're at the end of it, but there's always something new. And then came FinTech and now it's skate all around. So things keep moving, but at the same time, Things are getting very expensive. We have very few foundries uh, um, that even still exist that can still afford to build chips. And <coughs> many companies start thinking, do I really need to be on the latest note because it's gonna cost me a lot of money to get a little bit of performance gain. So this curve is, is definitely waning. So we come to machine learning. Now everybody wants to use machine learning and AI to make things better. Um, the, the world of chip design and EDA is a little bit different. So the first example here that of, of, of what happens um, outside our world is things like image recognition. I always like this picture. <clears throat> These are 16 uh, little pictures. You can look at them. Uh, which of them are muffins and which of them was a chihuahua? <laughs> you can see it's not easy. You really have to look closely, right? So, uh, but obviously, if you if you train a system with millions of images, it will do things much faster than you could ever determine this, and it will do a very good job. But it requires a lot of data. We also know RL, learning to play game. I picked a much simpler one here than AlphaGo or, or the soccer example shown in the previous presentation. Uh, but we all know um, there's a lot of potential in this area as well. Now, in our space, a little bit different. The, the first issue, and I, I think that gets lamented a lot, but it is true. We simply don't have enough data. And I think many of you out in the uh, in the academic field, they will say, what are you complaining about? You work for a company that, that works with all these customers. You have access to everything. Even for us, it's not easy. Uh, over the years, <coughs> many of our customers do not provide access to design data. It's on some secure disk um, you know, on, on their servers. Everybody uh, essentially has, has tightened access. Um, so even if there is data access, it's not easily accessible. And therefore, the idea of building like a huge training database where I can collect lots and lots of data um, just doesn't really work. It may work within the context of an individual company if the company is large enough, but having like a, a universal database that we could even we could build where we'd collect thousands and thousands of, of design data 
um, and then train a system on that is, is unfortunately not feasible. The second problem, which is equally difficult, is data is constantly changing. So we have eight, every 18 months we have a new technology node. And with that new technology, you will have new routing rules, new placement rules. You will have new behavior of library cells in terms of like leakage versus timing, things like that. Um, so once you actually, let's say you had collected a lot of data points, by the time you would have collected them, even that access would probably be out of date already. Things would have changed already. It's sort of like Tesla who's uh, training their cars on the road. They would constantly have changing uh, road signs or rules of the road, and they would have to start over again. So that's the world we live in. That's the two main things I think that makes it much more difficult for us. The third one I think isn't really related specifically to machine learning, but generally the complexity is constantly growing, and that's also a challenge. So from a purely practical perspective, this is not a research talk, um, I will talk, uh, I will tell you what we're doing. And we sort of split this, and this is not a scientific representation of any means, this is more of a product positioning perspective. We split this on the left side, you see that world ML enhanced tools. That means we have existing tools, right? Like a, a synthesis tool, a place and route tool, a physical verification tool, um, and um, they, they perform a, a purpose. And they of course have to deal with challenges and we want to use machine learning to make them better. A lot of these are really predictors, to be very honest with you. I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we call these AI-driven applications because these are targeted towards um, doing tasks that today are primarily done by human. So um, some tasks, for example, is manual floor planning. A lot of it is tuning of design flows. Um, or design parameters to get optimal PPA. These are like traditional, more human tasks where a solution you can argue doesn't really exist yet. So these are the two things, and I'll talk about the left side first. So um, actually the previous uh, presenter talked about uh, our L papers on placement, and um, I have an opinion on that also. Um, I, I would say, I think our L has been like, uh, it's been spoken about industry as it's the savior for a lot of things, but when it comes to, for example, uh, placing uh, a million standard cell instances, we have not found that an RL algorithm is really performing better than simulated annealing or a force direct placement or a quadratic solver. Um, and and uh, there's reasons behind that, but um, we don't really think that for that problem, it's actually the right solution. Uh, what we have done is we have built a lot of what we would say predictors. Um, and very often, let's say, I pick the example here of the uh, physical implementation space. There's a lot of steps that are happening, right? We all know there's the, the, the synthesis step, you take an RTL, you make, you make gates, you do technology mapping, you place them. There's a lot of things where somebody would say, well, if only I knew that this path is going to be critical at the very end of my flow, that I could have done something about it. Uh, that's a very difficult problem. So you can, you can uh, build uh, essentially predictors uh, with a lot of data points. You can train models that, for example, predict the timing, predict congestion at an earlier stage. Um, and that works to a certain degree, but it's not a slam dunk. And that is also because you're not operating on a static database. When I predict something, it isn't, for example, if, if I predict uh, SI timing, um, you're not doing this on a static database. Like say you in, uh, in, in the synthesis space, you want to uh, predict crosstalk. The problem is in between synthesis and your final route, your, your database is going to change, right? There will be all kinds of optimization placement steps that move things around. So the prediction itself isn't, isn't as simple. But it, it works for a number of things and examples are given here, like congestion prediction of like big ticket items, timing delay prediction, um, usage of, say, advanced waveform propagation and so on. Um, here's another example. Again, these are predictors. Um, this is for library cell characterization, which is very slow because it runs essentially millions of uh, Monte Carlo simulations. The idea here is if you, you built uh, surrogate models where you can, within high level of accuracy, predict uh, the values, and then you don't always have to run Monte Carlo simulations. We reduce the number of Monte Carlo simulations that you can run. So at the end of the day, you can say this is primarily a runtime improvement. And I have a third example, 
um, that comes from uh, physical sign-off uh, when you have, for example, physical DRC violations, whether they come from cells or routes. Um, you can um, essentially use this to uh, determine the root cause, or you might have like thousands of DRC that are actually caused by one uh, particular net or one example. This is the kind of things where a human is, is not very good at, and um, um, essentially training a model and, and finding the root causes for this is, is a much more efficient way. So these are some good examples of, of what we have put into our existing tools. And then we have this whole area of what we call AI-driven applications. As I said earlier, these are essentially new applications of things that don't really exist yet. And uh, one of the big things that we introduced is what we call design space optimization. It's a relatively simple concept. Essentially, in all these, um, you know, for example, the implementation space, um, in all these areas, you have essentially today a person who sits there and who tunes the input. So you have an RTL coming in, but you also have many different flow choices. You have maybe a library with a thousand different types of cells, and you don't know which is the right cell to achieve your particular power versus timing trade-off. You may have a, a process choices that you can make, like metal thickness, for example. Uh, constrained hybrid choice. These are all things where today a human just runs manual experiments. So he uh, modifies the script, he runs through, uh, say, the place and route tool, and he sees what results come out. Uh, this is a very good um, application where essentially you try to model a complex system, see how it responds. Um, and um, you, you, a system, of course, can run many, many um, of these trials in parallel, see what works, what doesn't work through uh, exploitation and exploration. And um, the other nice thing about this is you can do multi-objective optimization. You can create Pareto curves, for example, because many of our customers want to know what if I were to push my frequency to 100 megahertz, how much would that cost me in power, and things like that. So these are all the things you can do with this type of application. And I have here a nice animation that shows you an example on an actual customer design. Um, <coughs> this is... Um, a high performance MCU, um, and in this case, the customer wanted to achieve the minimum leakage power. Um, and of course, he needs to hit certain uh, uh, timing margins. That's at the bottom, you will see the timing, and on the y axis, you see the leakage. And the green dot is essentially what engineers have come up with. They tuned the flow, they, they picked library cells, and, and, and they've done lots of trials and said that's the best we can do. And the customer said, can you get to this green dot in a more automated, automated way? And, and we essentially, we have the system taking sample points, seeing what works, what doesn't work. You see some dots that are out there on the, pretty much on the left field. They might have good power, but very poor timing. And so that's not a good space. So you can see that the system uh, takes uh, multiple sample points. And when it finds a, a goodness somewhere, it, it keeps refining this. You can see already that it has beaten uh, the manual result. Um, and you know you can you can continue to uh, to improve on this and, and finally and that I can guarantee you always happens you get a better result um, than a human was able to do by essentially tuning many different parameters and this concept can be used for many different areas here's an example of flow plan exploration in this case it's a trade-off between uh, frequency so that's the the x-axis and chip size. Um, we have under the hood, of course, running an, an, an auto macro placer that you know, adjusts the chip size and then uh, runs uh, many different macro placements. And again, you can use that system and say, to search that space, tell me what you find. You can see there's, there's many different dots flying in. And then you can look at all the results and you can say, well, I like this dot the best. Um, and you can, for example, say, well, I want Maybe my fastest possible problem with the highest frequency, even if it's a little larger, you can choose a trade-off, um, and, and so on. And now, you can see on the, on the top middle, there's the human design chip, and you probably wonder how this compares. So that was somewhere over there. So you, once again, you can see by, by taking many sample points and sort of automatically searching and learning from this, you can get a much better result. Now, where I personally see the big promise is actually in reuse of this information. So all these, like if I go back to this picture, you can see this is expensive because I have to take a lot of sample points, I have to run a lot of iterations, and it's expensive during compute and also runtime. Now, um, the thing is if, let's say, you've done a chip 
and many designs are derivative designs. Uh, wouldn't it make sense to reuse a lot of this information of what you've learned on the previous chip? Um, in today's world, this type of information is in people's heads or it's in some script somewhere on disk and that person who maybe did the last chip, he, he left the company or moved to a different project, he isn't there available anymore. All the information of what was good is in his head. And now, maybe we have the capability where we actually store this information so you can have a, what we, what we have what we call the learning system where essentially it stores the behavioral components of a previous chip. It see like which parameters worked well, which didn't work well, within this, which range did, did, did it respond, which parameters are dependent on each other, things like that. So if you have a derivative product, um, you can start with that. You don't have to start from scratch because you, you've, you've seen a similar design before and then you can essentially uh, converge much faster. The other one that's shown on the right side is uh, retargeting. Retargeting means I take an existing design and I move it from one node to another node. Uh, of course, the node shift there shouldn't be too large, but again, you can use, because the design is essentially the same, only your node is changing. You can reuse a lot of the information that you've learned before. Here's an example that I have uh, um, on a CNN vision processor, that is the Synopsys IP. Um, what I'm actually showing you here is two different foundries. Um, and there are similar technology nodes, but they're two different foundries, and we have quite a few customers who are asking for that. They want, they did something in TSMC, and they say, well, I want a backup. I want to also do it in global foundries, as an example. Uh, what you see here on the left is a very similar, um, essentially a PPA optimization, in this case, frequency again versus power, uh, on the uh, original node design, and so the best, the best result would be in the top left corner here, those points. Again, you can pick the best trade-off that you like. Uh, what you see on the right is um, a comparison of using the training data from node one, now on the same design, but on node two. Um, these are the orange dots. You can see they get very close to the blue dots. The blue dots is starting from scratch, taking lots of sample points and seeing if I can, if I can get a, a good results. So you can see that you, you get comparable results by reusing um, your training data. And my last slide that I, I, I wanted to mention is, so from our perspective, um, so we're pushing QR, time to results, uh, cost of results. Uh, these are the three axes we're optimizing for. What I've shown you before um, was a lot of it was focused on the uh, physical implementations that I showed you, fraud planning, PPA optimization, things like that. Um, we are moving in the direction of software-defined hardware. And what that means is that I should use the same techniques for things like architecture optimization, for um, things like software loads that are running on a dedicated hardware, optimizing them for, for this exact specific purpose and optimizing the power for that. So you can use many of those techniques for exactly that same thing. And um, I think that is the promise to further improve the compute of AI and of course also non-AI chips. I hope I didn't take too long, but thank you.